My name is Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm honored to spend time with Klaus Mager. I did it right, right? You did it right. Thank you, Tammy. Good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'm from the Global Challenges Collaboration, and Klaus joined us last week for uh, one of our sessions. And I was really excited to see the work that you've put together because I think that it directly points to one of our global challenges and, uh, and your work is pretty transformational if adopted. So thank you, thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me, it's very special. Uh, so I'd love to invite you to share a little bit about what's brought you to this work so we can understand a little bit more about your journey. Yeah, my journey, uh, I started as a chef um, many years ago, obviously, in Germany. You know, I come from a family, fourth generation chef. My, my dad, my uncle, my cousin, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were all chefs. And I'm actually the only one, first one in the family, who doesn't have his own restaurant. Um, I rather joined my cousin in the United States uh, when I uh, came out of college. Um, you know, I progressed from being a chef and go to college and then joined my cousin. And make a long story short, I, I ended up with the Walt Disney Company as a director of food service. Um, had a wonderful team that uh, developed the Disney's California Adventure Food System. We went from ideation to operational startup and then I got to do the same thing again in Hong Kong. So for Hong Kong Disneyland, again, I came over by myself, ended up with 1,400 Chinese staff who were the most amazing people to work with. Um, best time in my life. I mean, I was so impressed with uh, the whole attitude and mindset towards work uh, on that staff. And then from there, uh, I uh, took a job in Germany as a uh, global uh, head of uh, market, uh, market target group strategy, target group, sorry, target group marketing, target group marketing group, uh, and the shirt title changed a few times. And, and what's that? Okay, so I had teams in 30 countries. We were operating in 30 countries. And my team uh, was uh, doing, was developing customer profiles. So we, we developed, a, a, we had a market segmentation strategy, how we identified them together. And then we would research those customers um, to see what are their buying preferences, what are their shopping habits, what are their needs. And we would communicate that and educate uh, our buyers, the procurement staff, the operating staff, and then the salespeople. We had 6,000 salespeople in the field. So we developed what, we, what I call the salespedia. And so we developed all the materials and the educational support, uh, the materials required for our uh, operating for our company in general to understand this is the customer they're going after. And then we also developed uh, special uh, uh, projects uh, where we uh, developed, where we bundled services, you know, where we call, which we called uh, a soft franchise system, which is something that I have been now working on in the nonprofit sector here in the US. But so anyway, I, I retired in 2012 uh, from that uh, a job, we came back to the United States. I've been was overseas for ten years, and I took uh, uh, a course that was when the universities went online. So Coursera at the time had sixteen universities. That was in twenty twelve. It just started, and uh, the <laughs> sorry, yes, and uh, I took a course at UC Illinois, uh, Introduction to Sustainability. Now I'm a guy who worked with metadata, uh, you know, my, my specialty you know, skill was to identify patterns in data. So when I was going through uh, the Maltusian population crisis, through the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the topsoil uh, issues and so on, um, it was stunning. And I actually wrote a paper at the end of the course. There were 70,000 students from all over the world in that course. And I wrote a paper saying, are we insane? You know, yes. Because that won't work. <laughs> it's just like, it's just so obvious that this is a completely insane uh, future we are unfolding here. And that then just led me to, uh, for, uh, into, into the material 
So I participated uh, in an innovations challenge that was uh, commissioned by the AARP, the American Association of Retired People. And it was titled Elimination of Food Deserts and Hunger for, uh, uh, for Impoverished People. And I had never heard, I had no idea what a food desert was, I never heard of it. And so in the course of writing that paper, I got deeper into the pathologies that are inherent in the US food system. Now, in my previous job, I was working for five years on, on this international assignment out based in Germany. I would go and study food systems in Russia, in China, in Turkey, in Germany, in you know, Czechia. I mean, we were in 30 countries, every single country in Eastern and Western Europe and five countries in Asia. And so when I came back, I looked through, the, through that lens at the American food system. And I, I mean, I, I couldn't trust my eyes when, when, uh, when uh, I started to understand how devastating uh, this system really is for people who are uh, on the fringes of society. So today we have 44 million people in the United States who depend on food assistance. So 50% of the employees working, for example, for Walmart or for fast food companies qualify for food assistance. They don't make enough money to buy themselves food and pay their electric bills and their rent and so on. So there is, there is something structurally wrong you know, in, in, the, in the system, and that's another topic. Um, but for me, um, the topic really is focused on climate change because it is such an immediate threat to our future. Um, and uh, the link, and this is really what my paper is, is uh, pointing out, the link between agriculture and the, and the way we grow our food and what we eat uh, is profound, uh, profoundly impacting our environment and uh, a major contributor to climate change. Great. So let's dive in because for me, when I when I he when I've read your material, it's so obvious, and I love that you've come by it through looking through the lens of food systems at such a global scale, uh, because it allows us to to really understand the scale of of challenge that's happening in the united states in terms of our food systems so yeah so what what really captured me and this wasn't right away but uh, after uh, the, the searching you know in, the, in, in reading through all these materials what really captured me to to understand climate change on an emotional level on a heart level right was what is called the gaia theory the Gaia theory, theory combines the earth sciences under one umbrella. And what it says is that over 4 billion years, life on this planet emerged. We don't know how and why and, and, and what caused it, but things came together that spawned a cycle of life that initiated about 4 billion years ago. And this life has uh, created its conditions for evolving. You know, it created uh, the atmosphere, it created uh, um, the uh, uh, structure that, that is required to have ever more complex, complex forms of life emerge. We are, we are a result of that system. We come from that system. And in our, that, that is an enormous challenge for contemporary religions who haven't adapted to this, to, to, the evolving scientific understanding of our species uh, and are holding on to, to concepts that are outdated. You know? I mean, these are concepts that are pre-science. Um, and the, the, surprisingly, uh, the Pope Francis has written another encyclical recently called Laudato Si, which is a phenomenal introduction on how Genesis you know, the first book in the Bible is in complete alignment with the idea of Gaia. In, in fact, totally supports it. You know, and, and Pope Francis uh, is, is saying that uh, you know, the earth mourns, the, the entire earth is groaning, uh, uh, nature, creation, God's creation is groaning under the burden that we place on her. So the, uh, but that has not penetrated into, into the general population. 
and it's being rejected uh, because there's just so much confusion in there. But once you understand Gaia, so that, that the earth is a living system, then it works like our body. You have to think about it like our own body. And if we get too hot, you know, if our body overheats, then we get sick. So there is a limited tolerance in, in what temperature we can tolerate between plus and minus. Um, and then our body is unable to compensate anymore. So when we are talking about um, a temperature increase of uh, one degree Celsius, it just uh, sounds like nothing. But as an average, if your body heats up one, one degree Celsius uh, over uh, its normal temperature, you don't feel good. Now, at two degrees, you're really sick. At three degrees, you're in the hospital. Four degrees, you're dead. Now, so the planet really ha has to be seen as a living organism, as a living entity, and we are a component of that body. So when in this context, when we look at greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases are, are uh, a vital component. And uh, imagine greenhouse gases are organic, right? I mean, this is, um, comes from plant materials. Uh, dead plants basically uh, you know, create uh, the carbon that is required to form this greenhouse gas. It's living, it's a living uh, uh, gas or, or created from living things. So that is required to, to uh, retain a specific amount of heat inside the atmosphere you know, around the planet to enable life. Now, the, 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 this has been adjusting itself over these billions of years. So the sun has actually reduced its potency, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, has increased its potency over the last four billion years by 30%. But this system has compensated by decreasing the amount of carbon in the air, so less heat is being retained because more heat is coming in. So now, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, when we are started with the invention of the combustion, combustion engine and the steam engine, um, and, and the discovery that coal can heat our homes and so on, the, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 has increased by 43%. So James Hansen, who is, you know, one, was the first out uh, climate scientist to warn the world in the 80s uh, that uh, you know, we are quoting uh, a, a crisis here, uh, is explaining that this is like setting off several thousand atomic bombs every day. Uh, um, so, and so the, the impact, just, just this number of 43% is, is just stunning. So for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, so ever since we, uh, you, uh, Homo sapien, has been on the planet, uh, the level of concentration has never exceeded 300 ppm parts per million. We are today at 410. Uh, it's, uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's never happened before, and it happened in such a short time that we haven't seen yet fully the reaction of the planetary systems play out. We don't know how this organism is going to respond to this. And it can't be good for us, is the, the one thing that we know with uh, quite some certainty. So the other issue related to our continued uh, release of carbon uh, by burning of coal, uh, gas, and oil uh, is the oceans. The oceans have actually uh, absorbed over 50% of the CO2 output of humanity, uh, which is causing ocean acidification, which, at the same, which makes it difficult, which makes it, uh, difficult for shellfish to form, for crustaceans to form their shells. Um, at the same time, the oceans are warming, which is causing bleaching in coral reefs. So the coral reefs are the spawning ground for phytoplankton, and phytoplankton generate oxygen. So uh, roughly two-thirds of the world's oxygen comes from the oceans. Over 20% of coral reefs have already bleached out. And they say, when you go online and you look at uh, all coral, coral reef bleaching, you see alarming you know, statistics and, and scientists who are wringing their hands about what can we do you know, to prevent the erosion of this because we need to breathe. I have a question. Uh, how does the ocean absorb carbon? Well, it's just uh, it, it, the, the uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I, I don't need to, to stumble all over this, but the, uh, the oceans have, uh, the, the ocean, oceans are acting as a carbon sink. 
because it's you know it's a pollution it's a pollutant that uh, goes in the that goes out into the air and when it touches the water you know it sinks in okay um, so it's open. literally absorbing in in terms of our garbage as well as the carbon at a molecular level it is drying it into the oceans exactly okay yeah. Thank you. And that acidifies uh, the, the the water, right? Yeah. So so the so there is and there is uh, I've written a paper on the oxygen crisis, which you know, we should be totally uh, alert uh, and alarmed about, and uh, which is a byproduct of uh, climate change. Then there is this issue of topsoil erosion. Um, the way we farm, the way we have handled our land. Um, is uh, uh, releasing all the nutrients from the soil because we have uh, 10,000 years of farming experience. And even in the Old Testament, uh, you know, it's documented how you need to treat your soil so that uh, your soil will continue to support you. There are civilizations uh, like the Israelis or the Europeans, Mediterranean folks, who have been sitting on their land for thousands of years and have been able to maintain the uh, organic material into in their soil and the viability of their soil. And they, they are doing that by harmonizing the, what they eat and their diets with what the farm can produce and should produce in order to maintain, it, maintain its viability. We have abandoned all that. You know, and we are overpowering now nature with synthetic fertilizers and synthetic oil, oil gas-based uh, uh, pesticides. Um, and in the process, we are destroying uh, this topsoil, which uh, without topsoil, we can't grow food. Now, this is an amazing number here, but the planet Earth has lost one third of its arable land in the last 40 years. I mean, this is an Armageddon kind of number. Uh, and, and, and you go through how much longer can we go on with that? Um, and still, uh, and I just came from a conversation uh, with uh, this morning with our the lobbying group in Washington, there is uh, no political will or uh, impetus to do anything about that uh, because the, this is a, a, uh, a uh, life-threatening issue in and by itself just to, to think about losing this topsoil. So... Climate scientists, there is, there is such total agreement. You know, the, there is uh, uh, a paper, a book that was published called Project Drawdown uh, by Paul Harkin, who was a co-author. And I just uh, uh, joined uh, a webinar with, uh, that, that he gave last week where he presented their latest findings. And you know, there are like 20,000 uh, scientists working on this project worldwide, Project Drawdown to identify the 100 most promising solutions that we can engage in, humanity can engage in, to mitigate climate change and prevent the worst impacts. So they have developed uh, departments uh, there and using systems mapping tools, consolidated uh, solutions under an umbrella. And so there's one that's called energy, and there's one that's called uh, uh, basically food. And under food, it turns out, is the single most important umbrella category uh, that, we can, that we can engage to, uh, to mitigate uh, our, our footprints on nature and, and support nature to regenerate itself. Um, so there is, no, there is no further debate around those issues. These, these conversations are so artificial it, it really it's hurtful to to listen to it um so yeah and and really because we have direct control over how we grow food yes. as humans um i i i think that and and it's it's not just what you're about to present in terms of carbon sequestration it is our living systems and how we feed ourselves yes. um and, and a, and a full-scale shift there, I think, is required for us to deeply consider. So, yeah, yeah. carry on. Well, and also interestingly, when you, as, as we go through this here, uh, the, the, the slogan really is healthy soil, healthy food, healthy body. You know, the, 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 the pathologies that we have inserted into the land, into the soil, 
into the earth transfers directly into our personal health, into our bodies, as we can see you now the, 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 these pathologies around us. So we have basically two major mitigation options. One is energy, and I think energy is well understood and it's well underway. The other is what I call photosynthesis, because photosynthesis broadly describes not just uh, recarbonizing the soil, but, but far more than that. So the power of photosynthesis is basically um, you have plants that use the, the power of the sun to absorb uh, CO2 from the air um, and, and, uh, and, and sequester that into the soil. And then as these plants die, they leave their root system behind, which is releasing its carbon then, uh, nitrogen, carbon into, into the soil. So the organic matter enters the soil in this way. And that's saying it in, in, uh, in the most simple uh, way. Um, the, the industrial agriculture um, uh, is using monocrop techniques, meaning they put the same crop into the ground over and over, which take the same nutrients out, which are then being replaced with synthetic nutrients, which are, of course, far inferior to what nature provides. Um, so they're doing this a few cycles, and then at some point in time, all you have left is sand, um, and the land is completely depleted. Um, so so that, that is what, what uh, has caused the uh, uh, crop plant uh, to, to be so uh, exhausted that, that uh, now almost uh, one third of, of it has already been abandoned. Then you know, we're cutting down the next forest to clear more land uh, for, for more arable land. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle that uh, uh, is very hard to disrupt because the system behind it is so, is so rigid and so uh, has such an inertia. So the most promising thing that came out of the Paris uh, Accord, you know, the, the Paris meeting uh, 2016, um, was what I call the four, what, what is called the four per thousand initiative. So that is the worldwide uh, effort now. And what that means is if we are able to sequester four per mil, four per thousand of soil carbon stock, it would make it possible to stop the present increase in atmospheric CO2. That means if, if worldwide we engage in, in uh, a form of, of farming that per thousand of, of organic matter into the soil, we can stop the entire increase, absorb the entire carbon output of humanity. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And, yeah. and reachable. You were a little bit glitchy in the, sometimes the connection in the internet is a little bubbly, but I heard, I heard most of that, that piece. But that's critical, that yeah. we, through our food systems, can actually fully mitigate uh, in terms of numbers uh, yeah. the, carbon, the current carbon output we can fully mitigate. So this is uh, uh, based on solid science. The IPCC Interna International Panel of Climate uh, uh, Scientists um, has, uh, has done all the background information on it. It's solid. Um, and uh, um, it is uh, really, and, and, and uh, in fact, we talked about it this morning, is uh, uh, an idea that needs to be presented to farmers, first of all, who need to understand uh, this better, and then to our politicians, so that as we move forward, uh, uh, creating farm bills and, and uh, investments into farming communities, farming capacities, that is the critical understanding to have. And um, well, let me, yeah, let's go on. So regenerative before you before you jump in there, I maybe you can share with us this this group that you're a part of that you met with this morning because I think that's really important. So Citizen Climate Lobby is a lobbying organization based in Washington. I joined them a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, they have a regional chapter. They have four hundred over four hundred regional chapters, over ninety thousand members, and I became uh, part of the leadership team of the national leadership team on. Uh, Agriculture, so we call it the agricultural action team. Um, and so, I've been able to introduce some of these uh, uh, concepts, and, and there are some very uh, 
um, smart people as part of this team who are well, very, really well connected uh, within the industry. And uh, that uh, idea has now resonated. So just this morning, we talked about the four per thousand uh, initiative and that we as an organization need to join that uh, and apply for membership and partner across and, uh, uh, and use this information you know, to communicate. Uh, but it is, you know, the, the way that the US political system works is you have, uh, I don't know, 400 and some members uh, of Congress and then you have 100 senators basically representing us. We look at these guys as uh, in Washington, right? But no, they are really based in, in Bend, Oregon, and in Portland, and in every major county in the United States. And they're people you can call. They have offices in your state, in your, in your area. You can look up who is responsible for you, this, for your district, responsible to represent you. Um, and you can call and you can raise your concerns. And that has an amazing impact. And so we see an awakening of the American taxpayer, the American voter, um, where they begin to realize that this democracy is running away from us uh, and that we need to personally engage and make it known that we're here and we're watching and we have thoughts about uh, how we should be represented and move forward. Um, so that, that is uh, a powerful shift uh, in the uh, national psyche, really. Uh, because we have been cruising, my generation, we have been cruising, basically not paying much attention to what is all going on around us. And then looking back and reading up on the uh, confessions of a financial hitman and things like that, <laughs> you go, what, what, what did we do? You know, that was... Uh, so now we are, we are uh, really suffering for our negligence as, as citizens. Yes. Um, so, yeah, and then there are other organizations. I mean, the Sierra Club is super active in, in climate change. Uh, there's 350.org, you know, there's the Al Gore organization. I mean, there's so many groups. So everybody should belong to one of those groups and make the, and, and, and uh, add to to the initiatives that have all wonderful materials and how to communicate, what to say, who to call. Um, and so that, that would be definitely uh, a level of engagement and everybody should, uh, should feel compelled uh, to participate in. So, Great, and, and we will add some links to those as well, to the video so that people can follow on. Okay, yeah. So regenerative farming, uh, it's really, you know, as we stated here, geoengineering is really a science fiction fantasy at this point. There is no technology out there that has the capacity, I mean, the volume that would be required to sequester billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, the ideas that are floating are all scary because, I mean, so you're going to seed uh, metals into the oceans uh, to bind uh, carbon, but what does that do to, to the sea life? I mean, so, so all, these, all these ideas are just uh, uh, untested, uh, unproven, and uh, uh, too, late, too little too late at this point. Uh, when we have, when we know what needs to be done in its restorative agriculture. Yes. Um, so yeah, the, the, uh, as from a political action perspective, the US Farm Bill uh, is, uh, is up in 2018. And it seems like... Uh, the best we may be able to do is to just stall it because it's a five-year bill. And if this bill in its current format gets approved again and lasts another five years supporting cotton farmers and wheat farmers and dairy farmers and basically commodity farmers at the expense of uh, uh, organic uh, and, and small to medium-sized farms, that would be catastrophic because we really don't have that much time to, uh, and this also was one point in our discussion we can't have another farm bill and then hope the next time around we catch it we have to catch it this time and that requires cit active citizens to engage you know, the farm bill is good yeah what are the points in the farm bill that that uh cause us to uh be locked into this large scale type of farming so it's, it's a one trillion dollar bill 
um, but uh, roughly uh, 750 billion are for food aid, which is well, very scary in itself. But uh, 44 million Americans depend on food assistance. And you think about the child nutrition program, 21% of children in the United States live in poverty, go up in poverty. The only meal they often get is in school. Now, in addition to that, there is a Child Nutrition Act where mothers in poverty uh, can, can get support, can get money to buy food. So it, it is, it is uh, a, a mind-numbing uh, statistic. So really, it's how the budget's dispersed. Right. It comes down to what, what happens with the money with the legislation, not the written legislation itself. Uh, yeah, but the, the, the written Obviously legislation... Obviously, it's connected. How it's being dispersed, yeah. So currently, um, meat and dairy is the bulk of the remaining funds. Um, and meat and dairy is not uh, what we need to, to... So 60, what is it, 60% of uh, the remaining budget goes to meat and dairy... 29% goes to grain, 1% goes to food and vegetables. So it's just totally upside down from what, uh, the, the, what uh, the population should consume and should eat. We are so, and the, the argument of the uh, industry is that we need to provide inexpensive food. Okay, everybody agrees with that, but you don't want to provide food that makes people sick. You, know, you want to keep people healthy and you're not keeping them healthy with dairy and meat you know, without uh, vegetables and fruit attached. So these subsidies need to be uh, reallocated. And there is a farm bill proposal out there by, uh, by an Oregon representative, uh, Blumenauer, uh, that is now gaining uh, attention in all the uh, sustainability courts, where he has made specific proposals on how we can support uh, small, medium-sized farmers, support startup farmers, to, uh, uh, to uh, get the kind of money and support that they need. Yes, and, and I, I'm curious what the pushback is on that. <clears throat> the pushback is vested interests in the industry. You have, uh, I mean, I, I was listening in on a conversation uh, a couple of days ago about the farm bill, and it was basically an argument uh, by cotton farmers who uh, want to um, who, who want more subsidies and more research money, and dairy farmers who you know want the same. And you go, why would we support cotton farmers? I mean, what has cotton got to do with child nutrition? Uh, but uh, cotton, this is the South, who uh, have a hold on this farm bill. Uh, and so tobacco used to be a part of the farm bill for the longest time. If you can believe this, the tobacco subsidies just ended in the last farm bill. This is a, they made it into the 21st century you know, because the, 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 the South has a political stranglehold on, on so many of these issues you know, that, came, that is related to the U.S. history. Um, so you, to, uh, to, get, uh, to get this money back and to, to take that money out, Politically, not an easy thing to do. Um, you, know, they, you have some very wealthy, very well-connected people who are very established in the political process who, uh, who want to keep it the way it is. You know, it's as difficult to get out as what I'm saying. I mean, the food system is as difficult to change as the oil industry is. You, know, you have gigantic, uh, 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 very wealthy interest groups here who uh, are used to keeping it this way and getting rich this way and staying rich and to have this kind of change that we are talking about here in the food industry is going to be as impactful as it is for the oil industry to get out of carbon. Yeah. I mean, they, they have trillions of dollars invested in, uh, in still in the ground in machinery and equipment and uh, pipelines and so on. And to walk away from that is uh, as painful as can be. And in the food system, you have the same thing. The system is so interconnected. It depends on staying in place the way it currently is designed, and it can't. You know, it's it, it's just not uh, it's just not feasible, and certainly shouldn't be uh, kept in place with government subsidies. Mm -hmm. But just like the oil industry continues to receive government subsidies by in billions of dollars, does you have the same situation in the what is called uh, corporate agriculture? Right.
And so it really is high level corruption. Um, so, uh, systemic. I mean, look at it. it is, it is, yeah, it is, it is, it is a co op. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, um, but, <laughs> you know, and, um, we, can, we can know this and we can talk about this, but as you can see, uh, the, when, you, when you watch the political process in Washington, you can have 80% of the population wants something and it's not happening. Yeah? Um, and so, so we have to find other ways to create pressure points or we have to simply ignore the system, which is my proposal really, ignore this entire system and create a new one around it. You know, which is uh, the idea of decentralized uh, local food systems, uh, starting from the ground on up, having communities embrace you know, their local farmer, their farmer's market, go to the grocery store manager and say, you know, why don't you have local products on the shelf? I mean, these sorts of things uh, will create an impact. You know, yes. More so than anything we can do in Washington. So one of the worst things in the U.S. Uh, food system is corn. Um, I mean, currently, if you, if you can imagine that uh, the United States growth has, has land the size of California under corn production, an enormous land mass, and they, that, that crop uses currently 5.6 cubic miles of, uh, of irrigation water per year. So when you think about water, how precious uh, uh, it has become, um, the, the Oqualla Aquifer in the Midwest is yeah. being exhausted. You know, they're pumping two, three trillion gallons of water beyond its replenishment rate per year out of that. So the water level has been dropping. So currently, the life expectancy on, on that aquifer is maybe 10 more years under current, under current production schedules. So, so the irresponsibility you know, of this industry to look at natural resources and, and allow this depletion to take place, uh, it, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, there's no word to describe it. The other thing, of course, is then the corn, the fertilizer use, because they're using uh, synthetic nitrogen made from gas. But when you apply synthetic nitrogen into a field it's not bound to the earth you know, so the first rain or even irrigation comes in it washes off it washes into the streams uh, into the rivers it causes algae blooms it's a major uh, uh, issue in 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 many communities 5.6 million tons of nitrogen each year just for the corn crop uh, now so then when you go so what are we doing with this corn well, we are creating, uh, besides 50% of it is being used uh, for animal feed you know, in, in these uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, which are uh, a horrible uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, so we make high fructose corn syrup, and high fructose corn syrup is used as a stretcher, as a filler in just about anything. You go into the supermarket and you look at your sausage, and it has high fructose corn syrup in it, bread. You know? I mean, not even just candy and, and sodas and the obvious things. No, I mean, it's, it's being used as a filler in all kinds of food products, soups, uh, and, and, uh, dressing, salad dressing. So it's, it's everywhere. And so the, the, the debates with the industry are, um, uh, uh, you know, to eat this much sugar, particularly a high fructose uh, uh, syrup, uh, which uh, flashes into your bloodstream instantly, you know, because there's no fiber attached to it. It just goes right into your bloodstream, and it creates a rush, you know, which is uh, as addictive as cocaine, uh, just the, the sugar. Um, so the the industry refuses to accept uh, all studies that have been conducted uh, in there, um, and and continue you know, to 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 push that high fructose corn syrup out. But this statistic here is that the average American increased their consumption of high fructose corn syrup, mostly through beverages and processed foods, from zero to 80 to 60 pounds per year over the last 40 years. Wow. During, during that time period, obesity rates have tripled and diabetes in, has increased more than sevenfold. So we have, a, we have a, basically a global epidemic 
uh, of obesity and, and uh, diabetes. You have gum disease, particularly in countries, uh, developing countries where we export this stuff, where they don't have uh, the kind of dental support uh, that we are enjoying in the Western world. So you have uh, countries uh, like Guatemala and Honduras, where all of a sudden they have a dental crisis. Uh, and so the, the, the irresponsibility of, uh, of, our, of the agricultural food system uh, to, to, to do this is just uh, amazing. So the, the combination of, of sugar, fat, salt uh, is really what the fast food industry and the snack food industry, or we call it the junk food industry, uh, is using, is creating um, uh, addictiveness in the food. They call it uh, craveability, yeah, but uh, it's, a, it's a buzzword for making your food addictive. And I mean, actually, while I was still working uh, at Disney, uh, I went to a seminar where this husband-wife team were talking openly about we're making our food addictive. And it was like their task, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, was, uh, uh, I, I participated in, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a course at John Hopkins University that was about the economics of obesity. And I wrote a paper called The Confessions of a Food Service Professional. <laughs> <laughs> And I was saying, you have to understand every single year, I have to squeeze my brain to figure out how I can get you to eat more uh, and, and pay more for it next year than you did this year. Yeah. And so your, your health is of no issue in this uh, debate. Yeah. So the, these, the, uh, the, the current farm bill and the current the way that the US government is currently supporting the food industry is actually uh, uh, contributing greatly to uh, this uh, obesity and diabetes crisis. And that's, uh, that is really, uh, so US farm policy is actually feeding up these epidemics, which is uh, just uh, heartbreaking to see. So there, is, uh, there, there are plenty of, of examples uh, on the net. Uh, Michael Pollan is a professor at New York University and he has done many, uh, speeches and written books about uh, the, uh, the food and the food crisis we're experiencing. It's very common sense, down-to-earth speaker. Dr. Mark Hyman is specialized in sugar and diabetes. So he, he's talking about experiments they have conducted uh, with animals, with rats, for example, between sugar and cocaine. Now, uh, given, given that choice, the rat will go to sugar anytime. It's more addictive than cocaine. Uh, to, to, these, to these animals, I mean, it's astounding. Yeah, so, so wrapping this up here, um, the, 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 the difficulty for the industry uh, to, uh, to shift out of this is that we have global corporations. You know, when you think about McDonald's, for example, 32,000 retail outlets worldwide who are only possible by standardizing food you know, to making it basically an industrial commodity. Yes. So the hamburger patty gets frozen uh, in the factory, gets flash frozen, packed up, sent to the, to the uh, retail unit via a, an amazing logistics system um, and is good for a year, you know, uh, six months later, is being put uh, in frozen state onto the griddle um, and then served on a bun that has a shelf life of uh, now three months and uh, uh, with a sauce that uh, lasts for two years. Uh, but the, the entire, the entire um, process is so automated that if McDonald's wants to change one menu item, they have to literally invest a few thousand dollars in 32,000 restaurants uh, in order to put a new piece of equipment in there or take one out and replace it. So... The, the idea for them to change their supply chain is numbing. I mean, it, it is, it is uh, amazing. And then when we go one step further and say the food source, you know, the, the, the land has to be decentralized because um, it, each, uh, each farmer has to respect the, um, condition, the soil uh, climate, uh, water conditions of his, of his environment, of his region. No, you can't go, it's like growing rice in, in the California desert. It's like water doesn't matter. Yeah? 
so they're flooding uh, this water in the, uh, to coral rice. I mean, those are insane applications of resources, natural resources. So to change that um, um, requires a complete remodeling of the supply chain, which is extremely expensive. So the better way is to just rebuild it from the ground on up you know, and, and just walk away from, from legacy systems. And I love that you're coming at this from a from looking at those supply chains. Uh, you were saying that your your uh, area of focus was from the customer to the procurement of and 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 having a view to that top level uh, development and and procurement to growing. I think it's really powerful to deeply consider that from that global perspective because it gives us a different kind of picture. Yeah, it is also empowering you know? um, because when you live in your own community and you think about um, what can you do, what influence can you have, um, apparently not much. But when you think about uh, 10 million people changing their eating patterns and shifting their source uh, of, of buying food, that is an amazingly powerful impact that will, that will register immediately. You know, so it's also important to understand, I mean, coming from a marketing background, um, these companies are constantly testing the market. You now they're constantly conducting focus group research. Uh, they're putting out a marketing message and they test how it resonates with the targeted audience, um, how it's being, being talked about. Uh, when they realize that a message doesn't resonate, they change it. Um, now, the, the sad thing is, even my, I mean, I hate to say it, but my, my former employer who I, you know, I mean, I love the company and all this, but here's the Walt Disney Company partnering again with McDonald's you know, to, uh, to uh, um, license the use of Disney toys, Star, Star Wars tour toys as Happy Meals under the argument that uh, McDonald's has advanced you know, their, their meal program and to make it kid-friendly. Well, there's no such thing. I mean, if you knew what was in these chicken McNuggets, uh, <laughs> no, no mother would feed that to their children knowing what's in this. You know? And so the industry is doubling down instead of uh, stepping back. So it really is about information. It's about education. It's about... Uh, particularly mothers knowing uh, what, what food is safe and, and uh, assisting them in preparation methods in, in, uh, because you can actually save a lot of money uh, when, you, when, you, when you want to eat healthy, you know, when you use legumes rather than meat, uh, you know, uh, when you use fresh vegetables, I mean, you can get uh, a really solid nutrition. So the industry uh, is, is working on meal kits uh, you know, and, and on making it more user-friendly for uh, people to buy more sophisticated food items to get away from this processed food. So you have uh, many grocery stores have a kitchen. You now they put out buffets like Whole Foods, but many others. So you can just you know, take off a buffet and put your food together. That idea has to be transferred into people who don't have a whole lot of money. You know, so once we achieve that, uh, to get into the low-income market and provide them not with uh, a happy meal, but with uh, uh, maybe a beef stew or <laughs> maybe a lentil uh, a stew or, you know, uh, 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 or beans and cornbread and things like that, um, whatever their particular ethnic and background is and, and food preferences, um, then we can really make some progress. Definitely. There's the piece of people's choices. But uh, part of what I'm curious, and I'm not sure we've really dove into as much as I'd like, is about carbon sequestration through the farming practices, if you wouldn't mind diving into that. because I Yeah, so, so this is biblical stuff. I mean, uh, and, 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 and to me, the most amazing thing is that so many professed Christians completely ignore I mean, I've had so many Christians tell me every single verse in this Bible is God's word. Okay, God's telling you, you know, to uh, rotate your crops and to use a cover crop and to leave your land idle every seven years. 
what do you have to say about that? Yeah, um, yeah so, so uh, it's very selective. But um, basically, uh, every crop takes different nutrients out of the soil. So you don't want to put the same crop in over and over because it depletes the nutrient levels and, and then the food that you have is, is empty. Um, in fact, uh, today, uh, food is so depleted already uh, that uh, compared to you know, 50, 100 years ago, you already have to consume more, more base food just to get the same nutrient level. So the first thing is that you don't put the same crop in over and over. The second thing is that you never leave your, your land open. That means after you harvest the crop, you don't till and then let the, let the land sit there because it steams out its carbon. So the land should always be covered. So that's why they call it cover, even during the winter, that's why they call it the cover crop. So cover crops are legumes, um, so beans, lentils, peas, yeah, that, uh, uh, that have, that have the, the, the uh, capacity to sequester the nitrogen into the soil. So this is a unique thing about legumes, which is why they are you know, used as a cover crop to re-enrich, recarbonize the soil between crop cycles. Um, so, so, that, uh, so it's no-till farming, you, know, you don't till, it's rotate your crops, and then it's plant cover crops in between cycles. Uh, those are the, the most uh, basic, most fundamental steps. Then, you know, modern science has uh, uh, a lot of other ideas. It's like the biochar, you know, where you uh, cook uh, organic matter um, and, or heat organic matter in an oxygen-deprived chamber. And, uh, and then that biochar is being sp uh, sprayed, I mean, being dispersed over the, the soil and that, that uh, uh, sort of is a, it's like a power pill you know, for the soil. Uh, to, to get carbon in there. Um, a number of other techniques. I'm, I'm not a farmer and I'm not uh, 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 very fluent with it. My focus really is, so here's a farmer, let's say you have a guy with 2,000 acres of land and he grows corn and he wants to take 200 acres at a time and convert it, you know, move it into an organic uh, regenerative process. Well, how is he going to go about this? If that means you, you, you will have in many regions in the United States, there's no middleman. There are no brokers. You know, there's no, uh, no co-ops any longer. Uh, so if he grows, uh, let's say, beans or lentils, who's he going to sell them to? Now, so the, uh, the brokerage function that is required to, uh, to pre-sell, basically at every crop that goes into the ground is sold before it's put in. Um, and... and uh, and so, with the absent of the demand equation, you know, where where he can, where a farmer can get a fair price for this crop, um, you know, it just makes no sense uh, to do that. Then, then there there is cost involved in uh, in uh, rotating your land. I mean, uh, no-till farming is more expensive, requires more uh, more different different uh, stronger machines and so on. So there is, there is cost involved to the farmer. So we should, in the farm, we should pay a farmer to sequester carbon. You know? I mean, why would we invent uh, super expensive technology, uh, high tech or science fiction technologies when all you need to do is give a farmer a few hundred dollars you know, per, per ton and he can put it right into the crowd. You know? So it's, it's just, uh, it's just so much uh, common sense that we could be applying here. Um, I'm, I'm actually extremely hopeful and, and, and positive because we are like so close, you know, yes. just, we just need to get the public to, uh, to better and to understand this and change our eating behavior, change our buying behavior, you know, call our representative and say, you know, we need to change this farm bill, uh, and, and, uh, get out of commodity support, commodity crop support. Yeah, because part of it is the is the vertical inter integration that you talked about in terms of of <clears throat> how the the cycle of of growing happens, um, all the way through to procurement and and customer decisions. 
Yeah. Uh, and and I think that 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 it's it is really important to make sense of it and to to give people a simplified version of a really rich body of information. Um, but at the same time, we need to go deeper to really understand what's under there. So. Yeah, I mean, even experts in the field um, uh, don't fully process how the system is feeding off each other. Um, <clears throat> you wouldn't have McDonald's if you didn't have Monsanto, you know, because Monsanto uh, creates uh, standardized processes that produce a potato you know, that is completely uniform in shape, size. Um, there are steakhouse chains that have this uh, onion, you know, this uh, flower onion. Well, they want to have this onion in a very specific size, very specific uh, uh, species and all that. And so to do that requires a specialized seed, which comes with precise instructions on, you know, you're using this synthetic fertilizer, you're using this pesticide, I mean, this herbicide, this uh, insecticide. And uh, so here's your growing cycle, and these are the applications throughout. Uh, and uh, so the outcome then is uh, a highly toxic product you know, that, uh, that is being defumed and so on, and then goes into, into circulation. Um, same as for animals. You know, the, I mean, the, the, uh, when you look at our, our poultry production, I mean, the genetic uh, conformity uh, of of these uh, birds and, and animals is uh, scary. You know, if there's one disease breaking through, you could have wipeout uh, in in your supply chain. But you have basically here's Monsanto providing seeds that create feed material. You have Tyson that provides breeding stock. You now that provides uh, the, so that breeder stock is being is is uh, moves forward. I mean, these are basically fertilized eggs, and they come into a hatchery. And then from the hatchery, they go into a farm where they're being grown out. Uh, and the, the feed, of course, is being sourced from the same company. And then it goes into a slaughter facility, which is owned by Tyson. And then it goes to uh, fast food chains and to Walmart. And so so these, this is an industrialized process where the farmer has nothing to say. I mean, you're a contractor, basically, like a just one, one step in the, in the process. So now to say, we want to move all that aside and here's the farmer and we want you to grow chicken like we used to, you know, free range chicken, healthy, no hormones, no antibiotics and give them some solid food to eat. You know? um, that, is, uh, that is a massive shift because the first thing that would happen is that um, particularly the fast food restaurants would have to completely change out their business model. Yeah. So right now they stay, they buy all their chicken from one or two plants in the United States. But now you have what fifty, a hundred, you know. So that uh, um, that that's, that's uh, you know, where, what I was referring to earlier is uh, is a huge hurdle run for the food industry in general. And uh, uh, how that plays itself out, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think it needs to be changed from the ground on up. Well, I also like what you've what you're saying in terms of well, there's this machine, there's this industrial uh, production paradigm, and then there's the other system that we can just nourish and support and create. And we've definitely moved the needle in terms of organic and what that means, and helping people to understand and make that connection between what they eat and and what happens in their bodies. So I feel like we're we're ready. We're very ready, but you're also being manipulated. I mean, for example, organic. Uh, most of what you get as organic today is hydroponics. Now, it's not created in soil. It's created uh, in a water bath, basically, with added nutrients. So when you see hothouse tomatoes, well, they've never seen soil. Now, or uh, your, your lettuce and uh, peppers and herbs, I mean, these are all hothouse uh, uh, created uh, uh, material, I mean, uh, uh, plants. So the, the idea really is, no, we have to focus on soil. Uh, soil and, and organic meat means um, cattle that was free range, you know, grass fed. Um, yes. So that's fine. But uh, um, otherwise, uh, organic grains, you know, of course, that uh, uh, 
uh, that is that is valid, but it has to come from the soil. So I'm I'm repeating all the time: don't focus so much on, on organic. Focus on healthy food it comes from healthy soil. So how do people figure out how to buy healthy food from healthy soil? Yeah, so one first step is uh, anytime you read uh, high fructose corn syrup uh, on a label, uh, just drop it, you know, drop it, because it's just, um, I mean, you buy a jam. And so the other thing is, you know, Michelle Obama, uh, one of her big things was to change the food label. And she wanted to have a consolidated sugar content. And the industry was, has been fighting this. And of course, with the next administration coming in, they canceled the initiative immediately because it's toxic to the industry. Because what they do is they call, you see, you see the first thing on jam, maybe let's say water. You know? Then you have high fructose corn syrup, and then you have corn syrup, and then you have sugar. So you add all this together, it's more than water. Uh, but so they're splitting it up, uh, uh, and so and then even some other uh, words for it um, that you don't even recognize as sugar. So, but but the moment you see corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup in your sausage or in any food item, don't don't go there. It's it's uh, it's uh, you know, it's uh, not not good for you. Um, yeah, and so so paying attention to labels you know, is the first step, and then. Uh, my wife always says, "Stay on the outside of the grocery store, you know? because when you go on the on the periphery is where is what you should be buying. It's where you get your dairy, you get your your meats, your fish, and then your produce. You know? um, and uh, and and one easy thing to do is work with their rooms. Um, I mean, there are so many phenomenal dishes in the Mediterranean kitchen." Um, that you can work with, uh, you can work with couscous, with hummus, uh, uh, with uh, lentils, you know, beans. I mean, there's some wonderful dishes available, and it's so much less expensive uh, than than buying processed food or buying meat. Absolutely. So, uh, how can how can we help you to get the word out? How can how can people help to align with what you're proposing? Yeah, so um, the the I mean I'm I'm uh, on the one hand uh, uh, attempting to get into into a technical environment where um, uh, we can build local a local food system or where we can assist you know the development of the advancement of local food systems that are already um, uh, structured yeah. and. Uh, and uh, uh, educate the providers because the big thing really is B two B business to business. Yeah. Um, the, the the retailer it depends, of course, on the demand from the consumer. So the, the, these are really two different issues. The, there is the consumer who needs to be educated on why this is important and how this all links up not only to your personal health but also to the health of your environment, to the health of your community. You know, because when you have local food systems, you're creating jobs, you're creating small businesses, you know, artists and food makers, uh, food processors, uh, small farms, medium-sized farmers. So that all uh, uh, comes into play. But uh, um, that, so that's one part of the equation. But the other side is really the um, and is the lack of infrastructure uh, that we find in connecting a farmer to a grocery store to business because the, uh, and I, I see this particularly in the grocery store market, not the, the many restaurants out there, individual private, uh, small, small private restaurants, they're already all over local community and buying local and sourcing you know, from farmers and so on. It's, it's really a craze. I mean, the people are, are looking for that. I mean, we, we just traveled from Bend, Oregon to, Palm Springs, all the way over to Temp to St. Petersburg, Florida, and we've seen so many little communities along the way where you find a restaurant and it's all about here's what we do local, here's who we are. The missing link is the grocery store, you know, because the the when you think about Kroger controls what sixty percent of the U.S. Uh, grocery market you know, because they own I don't know a dozen companies uh, that uh, that are all you know, massive chains, but uh, you would never think they're all headed up to like one uh, umbrella. 
and they they are saving money, saving costs by procurement. Now, then they go to a farmer and say, "We need a thousand acres of carrots, and this this particular carrot, we need you know five thousand acres of potatoes. How many can you produce, and so on?" And so the idea uh, to reverse that and uh, deal with a local uh, uh, wholesale market where farmers aggregate their products, uh, which then feed into the uh, business market, that uh, has gotten has gone lost in the United States. It exists everywhere in the world. Every country I went to to do country audits, whether that was uh, from, from Russia to Turkey to Germany, France, anywhere you go, there's a local wholesale market. Uh, it's a thriving local wholesale market, and the traders are right there on the floor. The restaurant guys, the grocery stores, they come and they have five cases of this. I want to, they buy what's on the market. Uh, uh, so the farmer is really free to produce uh, uh, what is best, what they can do best with their particular piece of land. You know? Yes. And so to get back to that system requires. Uh, and the, to the, the, the development of an aggregation capacity, and it can't be. But this is where where it's a, where I'm I'm really engaged, you know? um, because that requires a new novel approach. We can't go and rebuild physical facilities. It's a waste of money. Um, you know, there there are over four four hundred food hubs in the United States, which are all attempts by nonprofit organizations to, you know, creates a local food system, not one of them really has gone to scale, um, where it would challenge the market. And, uh, so the, the uh, uh, because they just, they just can't, uh, they're, they're working with small suppliers who are too expensive, their cost structure is too high. So to go and work with larger suppliers who want to get into this market and provide them an alternative uh, uh, supply chain route, um, that really is where, in my mind, uh, the, the need is strongest and where the breakthrough will come. I mean, it is, it is complex. And I'm so grateful to have a window into understanding how we can shift things. Um, certainly, like, appealing to, to our own health and people making buying decisions uh, and and maybe there's space for people to get in touch with their their supermarket and say I want more local uh, yeah. locally produced things. That's totally it. I mean, totally the uh, Whole Foods. You know, I've been uh, uh, shadowing these guys for a few years now. I was so impressed. You know, there was an opening uh, in Los Angeles, uh, LA Prep. Uh, it's a it's a uh, a company that builds over 50 kitchens for rent. Um, so you have small artisan producers who are renting kitchen space and all of this. Whole Foods came in, you know, um, conducted seminars. Here's what you guys need to do to sell product to us. Each store manager is allowed to have 10% of their SKUs sourced from local uh, artisan producers. Independent decisions. We are empowering our store manager. Amazon buys Whole Foods. Bezos comes in, cancels the whole down project. So now they're going backwards. Now they're eliminating many of these small producers. They want them to pay money for shelf space, which they don't have. And so once again, you're going back into bigger is better. Um, so so the uh, and, and the public is not fully aware of this. Uh, and and their, their audience, their, their whole food customer, would be the first one you know, to flip out over this if they really became aware of it. Yeah? So if Whole Foods had enough phone calls coming in saying, hey, we want this product back, you know, um, that might change their approach. Uh, but it's all about money, you know, it's like profit and maximizing uh, the return here. No one cares about, um, um, you know, what does this do to this small producer who just... Uh, you know, moved out from his personal kitchen in his home to renting a little kitchen space and making jams or dressings or potato chips or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the the uh, the participation of the consumer you know, to hold, in particular, the grocery store accountable is enormously important. 
I mean, where I live in Bend, Oregon, the restaurants are totally on board. But you can't find a grocery store that, uh, that uh, is, is engaging here. And then the other, the other end of the needle is uh, getting in touch with your congressperson or senator or your, your political 